this is Mr. Coates, and this is Apes Lecture number 26 on oil alternatives and natural gas. Uh, if we look at this picture right here, this is a piece of oil shale. And I've say, said this before in a couple other classes, but oil shale is a sedimentary rock. So this was formed a long time ago by different sediments piling up, mostly types of muds. And in those muds were trapped organisms, or dead remains of organisms. And over time, the heat and pressure of the earth turned those into small deposits of oil or uh, natural gas. And so uh, we can extract those small deposits now. And so this is oil shale here. And so if we take that and put it through the right process, we can actually get crude oil out of it. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk about these oil alternatives. There's a couple of them, and then we'll get into uh, natural gas. All right, so another type of alternative to oil is what we call tar sands. Uh, tar sands are a mixture of clay, sand, water, and bitumen. Now, bitumen is the useful part of the tar sand. It's the thick oil mixture, and this can be refined just like regular oil. It's a little bit thicker, but it can be refined. And tar sands are removed through surface mining. So just like you would look for, say, uh, limestone or uh, phosphates or maybe surface uh, deposits of coal, you dig down to them, you have overburden, you put aside, and you would then remove the tar sands and then process them. There are some pretty big problems with tar sands, however. Uh, they're, um, one of the problems is that they use a lot of hot water to separate the sand and the clay and the oil. And so this water then becomes contaminated. They have to remove the oil from it. Uh, so that's a very energy inefficient process, really. Uh, there's a lot of waste um, as well that goes along with this. Um, because of all the energy it takes to get the tar sand out, it has a very low net energy. And also it puts out a lot more CO2 because of all the machinery necessary to extract the oil from the tar sand. Now, one of the good things about tar sands is that Canada has a huge supply of tar sands uh, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and uh, they are in the process of using those reserves and uh, exporting those out. And uh, where we come in is this, uh, you might have heard in the nose, this whole Keystone XL pipeline. This pipeline is supposed to go from uh, Canada all the way through the mid-United States down to the Gulf of Mexico. So these tar sands, once they're processed, can be then uh, piped through this pipeline and then exported uh, out of the country and the continent. And uh, so Keystone XL Pipeline, that's the purpose of this pipeline. And you hear a lot of uh, controversy that surrounds this pipeline because of some of the habitats it's supposed to go through and some of the land disruption it's going to cause. Uh, I have a feeling that the Keystone Pipes line will probably go through eventually. I think uh, that uh, it remains to be seen what the damages will be uh, long term when it comes to this pipeline, but uh, uh, be ready for that uh, Keystone XL pipeline to go through eventually. Now, as I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of the lecture, we have shale oil as well. Uh, we have that shale. It's got a whole bunch of hydrocarbons within its structure. Unfortunately, those hydrocarbons are uh, in uh, small amounts, but spaced throughout the entire rock. And so what they do is that they drill down to these sediments and they use a, uh, a technique called fracking. And uh, they'll drill down into this shale and then they'll either uh, pump water down into this pipe at a high pressure, that's called hydraulic fracturing, or they'll send some kind of explosive device down into the well uh, in the pipeline and crack the actual shale and they'll, and they'll turn it into almost like rubble down there. And that will release the oil from all the small, small pore spaces. It will also release natural gas. Then this oil and natural gas can then be pumped out. Now also this is pretty thick stuff so it has to be reheated with usually hot water of some sort or some other kind of chemical and brought to the surface. So once again it produces a lot of CO2 in the manufacturing of shale oil. We have a lot of shale oil here in the United States. In fact, 72% of the world's deposits of oil shale are found here in the United States, mostly in North Dakota. And whole towns have been built up around fracking operations in North Dakota. Um, and this is the one reason why right now in 2014, we actually have a glut of oil in this country. Like I said, it does have a low energy yield and even lower than tar sands, and uh, that's because of the drilling and the fracking operations that have to occur. 
So what are some of the um, advantages and disadvantages from using these? I mentioned that both of them have a cost issue. Oil shale's much more expensive than tar sands, and that's just because of the way to get to them. Uh, both of them have very low net energy yields. The amount of energy needed to get them out is very high, and so they have low net energy yields. Um, once again, there are uh, good uh, uh, deposits in North America. It's easily transported. We have good technology to uh, get it out and move it around and use it. So it does have a lot of water pollution associated with them. All right, let's look at our second major fossil fuel, and that's natural gas. Natural gas is by far the cleanest of all the fossil fuels, and we'll see why in here in a minute. Natural gas is mostly methane, which is CH4. And this is one of the reasons why it's so clean, is that when you burn it, you only have one CO2 molecule made because it's only got one carbon in it. Um, some of these others um, obviously will have two CO2 molecules made when it's burned. This one will have three and so forth. When we're burning gasoline, uh, gasoline has a whole lot of carbons in it, so we get a whole lot of carbon dioxides out. So one of the good things about fossil uh, natural gas is that it puts out a lot less CO2. All right, some sources of natural gas. Russia has the largest deposits of natural gas, and they use this to their advantage. They actually have pipelines that run throughout uh, the Europe area uh, from their deposits, and they send natural gas to Europe, and they actually control the price of natural gas through most of uh, the continent there. Um, and so they have a lot of natural gas. The United States also has quite a lot. Uh, we have 3% of the world. It doesn't seem like a lot, but we do have quite a, quite a bit. Uh, most of the natural gas we use here in the country because we do have such good supply of it is from the United States. We don't really import any natural gas whatsoever. And if we did, we'd have to once again go to some of these other countries here that don't really like us. And right now we're having problems with Russia as well. So the, well, there could be problems if we ever run out of a natural gas. Now what are some of the trade-offs? Once again, it's a non-renewable resource, uh, so you can't make any more of it. Uh, it does have a high net energy yield, however. That's a really good thing. Um, remember, it doesn't take a whole lot of energy to get the energy out of it, um, so therefore it's low cost. One of the best things about it here is the low air pollution. Basically, when you burn natural gas, you get very little CO2 compared to others. And low land use as well, because most of the natural gas is drilled out. So you don't get huge areas of land that are disrupted, so not a whole lot of habitat loss. Now, what are some of the disadvantages? Methane, for example, is a greenhouse gas. Uh, and when it gets up in the atmosphere, it can increase the greenhouse effect and lead to climate change. The other thing about this is that it's very difficult to ship across oceans. It actually has to be liquefied. This is liquefied natural gas, and we'll see that in a minute here. But it has to be transported across the ocean in a liquefied form that's highly pressurized and very highly explosive, very dangerous. All right, so there are some variants of natural gas. Um, Butane is another one, and when you can uh, liquefy this and turn it into liquefied propane gas, and this is what we burn in our grills, and these little canisters you can buy or rent, at. and uh, so it's fairly cost effective to, to rent those and to use that kind of uh, fossil fuel, however, remember you are putting out fossil uh, CO2 in that case. And then I mentioned liquefied natural gas. This is the way we ship it across uh, country. Uh, this is how uh, it gets to Tampa, actually. Here in uh, Tampa, there's a ship that looks exactly like this one. It's not this exact ship, but it looks very much like this one. That brings liquefied natural gas to the port of Tampa every so often. And when this tanker is in uh, Tampa Bay, no other boats or no other big ships are allowed to go up and down the channel. Uh, this is such a dangerous cargo that they don't want any other ships in and around this ship as it comes up into Tampa Bay. And uh, so uh, very important that it's very dangerous to ship this stuff. All right, what are some alternative sources of natural gas? Um, in some of the coal bed areas, there is methane. And so if we can harvest this methane, then that could turn into a natural gas deposit. A lot of times this methane is just ignored. It Sometimes it's burned off during the mining uh, operation. Uh, sometimes it builds up in the mines, and this can cause explosions, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but there is a pretty big cost for a low amount of methane in this, in this case. Now, another one that could be in the forefront is methane hydrate. 
this one right here methane hydrate now this was kind of an interesting thing um, methane molecules are trapped within a water matrix so all these are water molecules here that are uh, bonded together through hydrogen bonds here and they trap a methane molecule these yellow ones here are the methane molecules and they hold them there and so you find this in areas where you find frozen water like permafrost in the Arctic and also in some deep ocean areas and deep ocean sediments you will find uh, this uh, methane hydrate and the great thing about it is there's lots of it out there it's very abundant uh, but the bad thing about it is it's very hard to extract and uh, once you start disturbing this water matrix this little cage that the methane is trapped in it releases the methane and you can actually get great amounts of methane released from this and could cause explosions so it's got to be very careful it can be very dangerous this is a picture of methane hydrate here this little thing right here and it looks like a piece of ice but once again the uh, water molecules are trapped in uh, methane molecules and you can actually burn the ice you can set the ice on fire and as it melts it will release the methane and so this is methane hydrate and it could be an energy source in the future however it's very difficult to get out of the earth well i hope you learned something about oil alternatives and natural gas in this lecture uh, and uh, i'll see you next time